Hi everybody, and um, so welcome to this uh, new office hours that we will be having um, once a month. Um, and so this is designed really to help you, uh, MLA students, um, answer the questions that I'm uh, getting asked the most often during my office hours, which is usually uh, related to um, uh, your studies after the MLA, PhD studies, conferences, publishing, and academic careers. And so I'm going to try to answer as many questions as I can during uh, those meetings. Um, I will give you a very short presentation, uh, no more than 20 minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes of uh, question and answers. And I also have a few questions that were sent to me uh, via email. So uh, the first session is about uh, preparing PhD applications, which is um, a lot of work. Uh, and so there's not going to be enough time today to get into all the details, but you should always feel free to email me if you have uh, more questions here. Uh, first, it's always um, a bit awkward to start with uh, that type of statement, uh, but I just want to uh, have a word of caution for you. Uh, doing a PhD is uh, very difficult. It takes, you know, four to eight years of studies. Um, and during those four to eight years of study, you have to focus on this mainly. Uh, there's not much that you can do outside of this, which means that it delays also um, your future employment. It delays probably retirement too. Um, and so you have to keep this uh, in mind. A PhD also may not be uh, entirely necessary for uh, the career that you want to uh, pursue. So um, keep this in mind as well. You know, you may not need a PhD, for example, to teach at the college level, for example. Uh, you also sometimes do not need a master's degree in order to enter a PhD. Uh, make also sure that the field that you are choosing to um, enter is not completely saturated. Uh, you have fields of study, for example, a lot of our students, you know, want to do uh, philosophy or history or literature. Um, this is, this is, those are fascinating fields, but uh, there's also a lot of people in those fields and it may be actually difficult for you to get a job after you finish your, your PhD. Um, keep in mind also uh, that uh, not all PhDs prepare you for the same thing. Some PhDs are very professionalizing, uh, others are very theoretical. And so uh, this is something also to keep in mind when you, um, when you choose the PhD that you want to apply to. Uh, many programs, uh, and it's all over academia right now, are not fully funded as well. Um, make sure that you uh, choose a program that is fully fully funded. And also, uh, lastly, uh, something that's very also important here, uh, you may have to take more student loans. So if you already have student loans, um, this is something also to keep in mind that a PhD may put you uh, into uh, more debt. So how do you select a program here? This is really the question that I'm uh, getting the most often. Uh, and there's no clear cut answer here uh, because it all depends on what you wanna do. Um, and so here are a couple of considerations that you can keep in mind, uh, but uh, this is really a one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation with your advisor, and this is really uh, your decision. Uh, do you want to do an online or an on-site PhD program? Online PhD programs are becoming more and more popular, uh, but they're not also the, uh, the most uh, well-ranked. Uh, so you, you have to take that decision. You have to make that decision for you as well. Uh, the ranking is very important. The reputation, where do you find those, those rankings uh, or information about the reputation? Uh, you have many, many rankings um, uh, available online. Um, make sure that uh, you know at least uh, some of the faculty there, that you know that there is somebody that will be there to support you in your research. Um, do some research also about the students and about uh, the job placement. 
uh, do people who graduate with this PhD in this program uh, get jobs afterwards? That's uh, a very important um, thing to keep in mind here. Is it fully funded? And also, uh, is it located in a place where you see yourself, uh, where you see yourself living for a couple of years? Um, so all of those are really things that you have to take into consideration. But there's no clear-cut answer here. Uh, you have to make that decision for, for yourself. Um, it's also a very good idea to send uh, an email of introduction uh, to the person that you think you are going to work with. Uh, introduce yourself, you know, uh, make sure that this is a person that uh, has, who has uh, interests that are aligned with yours. Um, and uh, one thing that I would like to stress here is that most of the time when students send those emails, uh, they also get disappointed because they are not receiving uh, an answer. And so you shouldn't really read too much into that. Um, a lot of those professors, a lot of those colleagues uh, are overwhelmed with work. Um, and uh, and you you do get you know a lot of prospective students emailing you and usually it's not on the top uh, on the top of the, the things that you that you want to do that you have to do uh, during the day so um, there's a those colleagues will receive a lot of emails it's not because they don't respond to you that they are not uh, interested usually if they do not respond to you right away they will respond to you once they read your application and they think that you are a good match um we already did that um What's the application package? What's the application like? Usually, uh, there are uh, five items, and those items uh, really don't change. It's always the same thing that you have to um, to give uh, the application, um, the the admission committee. Uh, the most important one it's a statement of purpose. And so tomorrow, uh, I do have another workshop specifically on the statement of purpose. Uh, you have to write your CV, you have to have letters of recommendation. So for you guys, it will be probably um, a letter from an undergraduate advisor and a letter from your advisor here in the MLA program and a letter from another, um, another professor, uh, your transcripts. And uh, often, uh, but it's becoming more and more rare though, uh, test scores. Uh, if you are a non-native speaker of English, um, you will have to take probably the TOEFL. Um, uh, and most students do still have to take um, uh, the GRE. Your statement of purpose, just a couple of things here if uh, you cannot attend to uh, tomorrow's uh, session. Um, the goal of the statement of purpose is to tell the committee that you are a good fit for um, that you are a good fit for the program. Excuse me, I'm doing, uh, I'm trying to answer the chat too. Um, so really you should answer two things. You should do three things here. Uh, you should summarize your past, present and future uh, in the academia. What is your intellectual trajectory? What are your academic and professional goals? Um, and three, you need to answer uh, what is your fit uh, in the program. Uh, I'll flesh out all of this uh, tomorrow. Uh, so this is just to give you a, a quick summary here. Um, the tone is also very important. Uh, make sure that you are professional, that you are factual, precise, uh, respectful of their time. Um, don't be too... Um, uh, I hate to use that word, but emotional. Um, you are uh, you are already a scholar. Present yourself as a scholar. Uh, do not present yourself as a student who's trying to get in. Uh, it's uh, it's really the best advice that I can give you. Uh, in a nutshell, in two pages, you need to make a point. Do the search committee um, will the search committee want to invest time, money, and energy in you? after they read those two pages. Uh, and so that's very, that's really the question that should be driving uh, this, this essay. What's happening then behind the scenes? Um, so once you send out your application, usually in December or January, uh, comes the waiting game. 
um, remember, guys, that uh, they will probably receive, if it's a good PhD program, a thousand applications. So it's really um, it's really a lot of time that they, the search committee or the admission committee is going to devote to those um, those uh, those applications. Uh, however, most of the time they cannot accept more than 10, 20 students at best with uh, you know um, a fully funded package. Uh, so usually they will uh, start to schedule interviews in February. They will usually those interviews will probably uh, be scheduled in March. In March, you will go on campus, um, and the admission letter will probably be sent um, late March. Uh, that means that if you are rejected from those program, uh, from a program, usually if you haven't received any news from them by February, uh, it's not a good sign. But the official rejection letter uh, is probably going to be sent sometime around June. So um, you've been very lucky and you've been accepted to uh, many, many different programs. And let's say you have five, six um, uh, admission letters. Uh, what should you do here? Uh, you should absolutely compare and contrast. It's just as if you were offered several jobs, okay? Uh, you should absolutely ask for uh, follow-up questions. And the most important thing here, uh, and I cannot stress enough, remember that this is just like a job. You need to, to negotiate your contract. In most cases, in most cases, when they will send you um, a letter stipulating, you know, your your stipend, for example, or your salary, uh, there's room for negotiation here. So do talk to uh, the admission committee uh, and make sure that you get the best deal that you can get. Always remember that you will be uh, part of the workforce at the university. You will teach classes. You will represent the university at conferences. Uh, you will do research on behalf of the university. So this is very much a working contract here. Uh, so make sure that you negotiate that. Uh, if you are being rejected, if you do not get into the program that you um, wanted to get in, um, you can absolutely ask um, uh, the person that you've built you know, a relationship with, uh, if you have one, the reason why but don't feel entitled here again to uh, a response. Again, they may have received a thousand applications. They may not remember you. Um, and the fact that they have to select, you know, 10 to 15 applications in those 1000 uh, really means that it's a, it's a very competitive market. And so um, that's all that I wanted to share here uh, for you guys. And I want to make sure that we have time for questions. And I've received uh, a couple of them uh, via email. And if you have some, you can pop them into uh, the chat box. Uh, the first one that I received was about financial aid. Um, so uh, most uh, PhD programs will offer um, a funding package. And so this funding package usually consists of five to six years of funding. And that funding means that you will have full tuition remission and a stipend uh, for five to six years. Um, that stipend is never a lot of money, of course. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I hear that now some stipends are like in, in the 30, 40K. Uh, in my time, it was, if you had 25K, that was, that was really a lot of money. So that's uh, really something to keep in mind here. Uh, if you live in a city, say like uh, LA, New York, DC, um, that's probably not enough to live in those, um, in those areas. And in some, areas, of course, it, 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 it's more than enough money. So, um, so keep this in mind. And of course, you always have to read, you know, the, the fine print here. Um, is it a nine month contract? Is it a 12 month contract? Do you have health insurance? Uh, or do you have to pay for your own health insurance? Um, all of those are very important um, uh, items that you need to discuss with uh, your um, 
with your advisor. Uh, another question that just uh, got here uh, in the in the in the chat box: um, What if you don't need the funding package? Um, that's great. Uh, if you don't need the funding package, um, you can basically apply uh, uh, anywhere. Uh, make sure, of course, uh, that um, do remember, though, that, that when, when I talk about the funding package, I'm talking also about full tuition remission and a stipend. So um, if you go into, you know, five, six, seven years of studies, um, tuition may be, uh, may, be, uh, may be quite heavy. Um, how common are programs that assist you with housing relocation efforts. Uh, I'm hearing through the grapevine that they're becoming more and more common. Uh, I know that in my programs, you know, there were many people who were um, accommodated on or housed on campus. Uh, in the, in, at the same time, you can also apply for a job on campus as an RA, for example, uh, or as a teaching assistant. And some, some of those contracts also provide you with housing. Um, but it's becoming more and more uh, common. Uh, the, best, the best thing to do really is just simply to, to ask. Um, yeah, and also some programs, you know, um, Dr. DeSisto here is, is letting me know that some programs you know, are not fully funded. Um, which is very true, uh, and so you need to find ways, of course, to fund your uh, your studies uh, in one way or another, and uh, you may need to be creative. Uh, my program was not fully funded either. Um, it was it was five years of funding. Uh, six year was um, optional, uh, but most people would end up getting um, a, a teaching assistant gig. Uh, for their final year, and believe it or not, but my my teaching assistant gig was in the MLA program at Northwestern University, so that was my very first full time teaching job. Um, I have another question here uh, about um, how do I select a uh, program? Uh, that's a very good question, and so my advice to you guys is to be uh, ambitious. Um, do not limit yourself to the schools that are around you. Do not limit yourself to the schools that are fully online. Uh, be as ambitious as you can. Uh, and that means here, uh, apply to the best schools in your field. Uh, may that be Yale, Princeton, Johns Hopkins, uh, Harvard. Uh, apply to where uh, the best scholars in your field are working. You will need their letters of recommendation. You will need their networks, and you will need the name of um, a prestigious school on your CV in order to get a good job. So, uh, if you are looking to work in academia um, after your PhD, uh, go with um, the most prestigious program that you can find. So, uh, don't be shy. Apply to those um, those. Uh, those prestigious schools. Uh, and we have been very, very, um, uh, we have been very, very lucky to have uh, several students in the MLA program who were accepted to those, uh, uh, to those schools. Uh, another question about how to uh, take a full advantage of your studies in the MLA to prepare yourself for a PhD program. Um, Two options here. Um, if you know that you uh, do want to get a PhD or to apply for a PhD after uh, the MLA program, and you know that right away when you enter the program, um, start talking about it with your advisor, uh, either Dr. DeSisto, either myself, uh, and we'll make sure that we have a plan here. And it's, you know, the sooner you start thinking about those things, the better, you know. And it's also completely okay to uh, drop this goal, you know, midway through the program. That's totally fine. Um, because we can help you, you know, build the best portfolio, build the best application for you. 
um, in terms of um, choosing courses in the program, uh, as you know, the program is uh, interdisciplinary, which means that we do offer, you know, a, a lot of courses on a wide variety of topics and in many disciplines. Uh, but let's say you want to focus in history, you may not be able to only take history courses. Uh, you may well be able to do that, but uh, it, it may not always happen. So one option would be to, of course, take as many electives as you can uh, in your field of study. Another option that I always um, uh, try to convince students to, uh, to go into uh, is to take as many core courses as you can. Those core courses really will help you define what's a discipline, uh, what's interdisciplinarity, uh, what are research methods, you know, what are the texts that you need uh, to know um, to have, you know, a broad culture in the liberal arts, in the humanities, in the social sciences. And so this is also a very important thing to consider here. Take as many core courses uh, as, as you can. Uh, and finally, uh, what I think is also uh, pretty important to do here um, for your PhD program, um, it's to get a strong writing uh, sample. And uh, the best way to achieve that, I think, uh, is to take uh, the capstone uh, and to make sure that by the end uh, of uh, your courses, your curriculum in the MLA program, you do have uh, a good, a strong writing sample to include in your application package, you know, usually 20, between 20 to 25 pages. Um, so if you intend on doing a PhD after your MLA program, it's probably better for you to, uh, to register for the capstone. Um, I had another question about uh, financial aid. How much is the, the stipend? Um, Again, the stipend, which is the salary that you will get uh, during your uh, studies um, uh, as a PhD student, uh, it varies tremendously. Uh, so some schools will offer, you know, as low as $5,000 a year. Some schools may offer, you know, 45K a year, um, probably more in the sciences than, than in the humanities. Um, the school that I went to, Northwestern University, uh, was pretty ahead of the game um, back in the days. And so we had a pretty strong stipend and a pretty strong funding package, um, which was, I believe, uh, 20K. But, you know, of course, that was 12 years ago. And so that, 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 was, that was doable. You know, that was a livable uh, salary. Um, what I'm hearing now uh, is that... Um, uh, they have increased dramatically uh, their stipend. And I think most people are getting between 30 and $35,000 uh, uh, a year. Uh, one final question here. Uh, can the capstone be taken during the final semester or is it a standalone? Uh, I know it's a lot of work, but wonder if you can take the capstone plus one other course in the last semester. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can take two courses. Uh, you can take the capstone and another course, or you can take the capstone uh, in um, uh, as a standalone course in one semester. Uh, and again, we're talking about this because the capstone is, um, I believe, the best way to have a strong uh, writing sample uh, for your PhD applications. So if there's no other questions here uh, for today, uh, we will end here. Uh, and uh, tomorrow, uh, I'm having another one of those workshops, which will be entirely devoted to the Statement of Purpose. The Statement of Purpose is a two-page essay that you have to, um, that you have to uh, uh, complete as part of your application uh, package. Uh, and it's usually an essay that uh, you will probably take uh, many, many, many weeks to write. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a very it's it's very formulaic, but at the same time, it's also very, very difficult uh, to write. There are many questions that you need to answer in a very short um, uh, amount of pages, a very small amount of pages, and so um, it's an exercise that most students find very difficult. Um, I'm always here to help, as you know, uh, if you have questions about uh, PhD applications, how to select the PhD programs, um, and uh, you can always, of course, uh, email me. So thank you so much, guys.
and uh, I will see you tomorrow.